please be patient as we let everyone in. This is definitely a very popular topic. We already have a lot coming in. Um, okay, just a few more people in from the waiting room. Okay, while we wait for anyone else who is coming, thank you everyone for joining us today. So hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Digging In Season 2. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series, and Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. For a schedule of dates uh, presenter and presenters, please visit us at uh, the pvd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. And if you enjoy our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And we would like to specifically acknowledge MAS member and donor to Digging In, Carol Weed. Thank you on behalf of your society, of the society for your support. And today we are very excited to welcome Ellen Berklin. For the past decade, Ellen Berklin has served as the archaeologist for the Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR managing 500,000 acres of below ground resources for the state of Massachusetts. And prior to working for DCR, she was the archeologist of the city of Boston. And Ellen has conducted numerous archeological digs across Massachusetts at locations such as um, the Central Artery Project, the big dig, uh, the Paul Revere House and at the African Meeting House on Nantucket all the while ensuring the participation of descendant communities in her work, as well as creating public outreach and educational programming opportunities for the public. Um, at the conclusion of this talk, viewers are going to be able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function, either at the bottom or at the side of your screen. Um, we will then give our speaker time to answer as many questions as they can with the understanding they might not get to all of them. So welcome, Ellen. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Lindsay, thank you. Thanks to the Peabody Museum in Andover and to the MAS. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, this was a great project. Uh, it involved the dedication and time and energy of many professional archaeologists and others uh, to the uh, end, the completion. And what you're looking at now is a stone, a uh, headstone that was put up in the Graceland section of Mount Hope Cemetery in Mattapan, Mass, and uh, commemorating the 61 uh, Bostonians. They were actually, you'll see during the presentation that there were 61 uh, grave shafts that were excavated. However, there were 50 um, victims of smallpox that were um, disinterred and studied and then delivered uh, to the cemetery this past uh, May, um, last May 5th, 2020. And as Dave George of Heritage uh, Consultants LLC down in Connecticut, the lead consultant on this project said, this is probably the first time ever that pandemic victims have been reburied during a pandemic. And it's true. Um, the lead story, I'm going to tell you a story because uh, this was not part of my job description, but shortly after Hurricane Sandy hit Massachusetts, New England in general, uh, monies became available through the Recovery Disaster Act, and that was in 2013. My boss then came to me and said, Alan, will you write a grant, um, anything to do with impacts to, you know, coastal uh, cultural resources? And I was like, sure. Um, so uh, to explain a little further, um, I manage a number of the Harbor Islands and manage the below ground resources, I should say. And we don't have anything in place uh, currently that involves a systematic uh, monitoring or surveying of um, uh, impacts to these archeologically sensitive areas. So 
I, I, 10 years ago when I began at DCR, I began going out in the spring and then in the fall to see what damage had occurred during the winter and then uh, through the season. And uh, one of the areas that was on my radar was the Gallops Island Quarantine Cemetery. Um, this cemetery had been exposed in 2008 and my predecessor, Dr. Thomas Malstadt had stabilized it uh, using tons and tons of aggregate and um, had compacted um, the cemetery on its northern limits uh, to protect uh, remains that had been eroding into the harbor. So this was not a new problem and it was gonna continue to do so. And the structural engineers, the maritime engineers that I brought out there said, well, you can either build up the seawall twice the height of what it is now, which will cost you millions, or you can move the cemetery. So I was like, well, that'd be a good topic for a grant, um, having no idea what I was going into. So um, I'm going to, uh oh, it is not advancing, Lindsay. Um, don't know what to tell you then. Uh, huh. Well, this is weird. Sorry, everyone. We've been having technical. Oh, oh there we go. Okay. The wind. Okay. Uh, wait, it is windy out there. You can tell by my hair. Um, so um, you're probably wondering about the title, Nehemiah on the Wall in Troublous Times. This was actually from a broadside from 1668 uh, in Boston, where um, during an election year, this was an election sermon that was given and people were requested to fast because of the predominance of smallpox that was raging through Boston. Now, smallpox has been a big issue for thousands of years. Um, and um, Massachusetts is critical in the role, not only of medicine because of Harvard across the river, but because of its uh, importance in the port city and immigration. And we didn't have a formal immigration uh, station until I think it was 1913 in uh, East Boston. But Massachusetts was the uh, first um, place to inoculate for smallpox on this side of the Atlantic. It was the first state in the union in which vaccinations against smallpox were performed. First medical publication in this country was on a broadside on the treatment of smallpox published in Boston. And the first state compulsory law for the vaccination of school children was passed by Massachusetts legislature. Now, I probably should have put up a vaccination card that I just saw on the state archives from the Milton Poor Farm um, stating that they had been vaccinated against smallpox. But I found this. Um, uh, illustration, a dramatic representation of the power of the Hindu goddess of the smallpox, quite compelling. So I can't start without thanking so many people. First of all, this was uh, funded entirely by the National Park Service uh, and was administered by the Massachusetts Historical Commission at the request of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation. Um, I uh, quickly, um, without having excavated a cemetery, uh, let alone a quarantine cemetery with uh, smallpox victims, contacted Dr. Michael Trinkley of the Chikora Foundation in South Carolina, an expert on uh, recovering, um, burial recovery and picked his brain and he was great. He gave me so much guidance and information and assisted in navigating me through this uh, application um, to remove the first three rows of a cemetery. And I have to say that his one advice, uh, the, the most important advice he gave me was hire a good genealogist because um, you, you'll want to see if you can reconnect these people um, to their next of kin. And um, in talking with the federal reps that actually selected the grant, um, and when they came up to visit, to visit the site, they actually said to me, that was one of the reasons, um, you including a genealogist, a genealogist to see if you could locate next of kin. Now we thought this was gonna be easy because we had a map from 1906 that was produced by the city of Austin. And you're gonna be seeing that shortly, but it was of no, no use at all. So that said, I now have to go on to thank Dave George, the CEO of 
heritage consultants in uh, LLC down in Connecticut. And he subcontracted with Chris Goodwin and Associates out of Maryland and um, subsequently uh, hired, well, Kath, Kathy Child was instrumental in this whole project. Probably the hardest worker I've ever met in my life and just so passionate and organized, which is what you need if you're gonna be excavating on an island. Now, anyone here who has actually excavated on an island know that you're dealing with a number of moving parts. Um, you're dealing with transportation, you're dealing with seasonality, you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with lodging, you're dealing with um, major uh, large equipment, you're dealing with storage, you're de dealing with security, you're dealing with a number of issues. Plus, don't forget about your permits. You have to get all of your permits through um, the Department of Health uh, in Boston. Uh, so, uh, I, I first of all want to thank the entire crew from uh, Heritage, from uh, Chris Goodwin and Associates, and all the researchers and professionals that contributed to the report. This is all of their work, um, and I thank them. The city of Boston was wonderful. Jim and Presha, uh, he issued all of the death certificates, even though we didn't know who we were digging up at the time. We thought we did, but we didn't know. Joe Bagley was instrumental. Um, the artifacts were actually processed at the city archaeology program in West Roxbury, and they were stored there for a year and uh, under good care. And then Tom Sullivan, who is the director of cemeteries under Parks and Rec for the city of Boston, donated two vaults at Mount Hope Cemetery and covered the cost of reburial. Um, so uh, and again, special thanks to Dr. Michael Trinkley, uh, director of the Chikora Foundation. So let's begin. I'm going to orient you here. Gallops Island is a small island located between President Roads and Nantastic Roads in Boston Harbor. They're the two main deep draft uh, portions of channels in Boston that get you into the port. Uh, Gallops Island was used for thousands of years uh, by the first people. Um, and it for seasonally, and we actually have, um, it has been used, uh, the land use history is military and um, social welfare institutions. Uh, of course, it was uh, uh, private, uh, privately owned by the Gallops um, uh, in the 16th, 17th century. So long land use history, um, Multiple archaeological campaigns, we know um, very uh, sensitive for arch in indigenous archaeological sites going back thousands of years all the way up to present day. Here is a view um, from the uh, looking west. And if you look directly in the center at the base of that uh, drumlin, um, Boston Harbor is a, a drumlin formation created during the retreat of the last glacier between 18,000 and 14,000 years ago. Uh, and it is unconsolidated. These are drumlins. These are elliptical uh, shaped uh, unconsolidated sand. They're very fragile. And uh, you can see the robust uh, disintegrating seawall that was put up in the 1850s by the Army Corps. Um, right in front of that darkened area, which represents the uh, restabilized um, island after the, uh, I believe, the first stabilization efforts. This is a photograph looking uh, west, and it's showing the uh, seawall, which is breached, completely breached, and it it wasn't when I actually started 10 years ago. So you can see the damage. Um, we're talking about twice a day impacts from wind, rain, freeze and thaw, boat wakes, storm surges, neat tides. And it's, um, it's tragic what we're losing out there today. Um, so it's showing the limits of the cemetery and um, the pavilion, which we'll see in the background up there and the site datum that was set up. This is a map I mentioned. This is from 1906, generated by the Boston City Engineer. It actually shows 
the seawall on your right hand side and the plan for the burials that were put in. On the left hand side, you see a very detailed, beautiful handwriting. Um, and of all of the purported people that were buried there, including their age, the time they were admitted, how long it took for them to pass. Um, and we even had uh, additional information, ethnicity, occupation, place of birth, and parents' names. So this was instrumental. Thought with this map, with a genealogist, no brainer. We're gonna find contact next to kin and they're gonna be accepted by the families. We were wrong. The preservation, um, and you'll see this shortly, uh, of the remains was not good. So to mobilize, um, they were mobilized uh, uh, twice. Uh, the first time it was my mistake. I thought I would be able to pull an emergency notice of intent for chapter one purposes, uh, digging in coastal zone areas. I was wrong. Uh, we had to submit a full application and get a certified engineer to stamp, create a map of the coastal area. I had to go through a trial and hearing and I had to come up with a thousand dollars. And I remember contacting Dave George and calling him in Connecticut and saying, I need a check for a thousand dollars. I have to drop off at the conservation commission in Boston, the Department of Environmental Protection isn't letting us move forward. And Dave was like, no problem. I'll meet you at the Sturbridge Village. I'll meet you in Sturbridge at the McDonald's and I'll give you a check. And I did, I drove down there. He handed me over a check. We put it in and we had to wait till the following season, September to mobilize again. So it threw everything off the scheduling, um, the uh, team, the work, um, all of these crews had, had plenty to do. Uh, in the meantime, but it just threw off uh, home rental, transportation plans, equipment rental, um, just really threw a wrench in the in the pot, if you will. This is Kathy Child in the center, uh, the leader of this amazing crew who undertook um, these uh, excavations. They worked six days a week because again, it's an island environment. You're, regard, you're relying on weather and transportation. And um, they contributed to a, um, a, a wonderful final product on this. So this is an overview um, facing uh, east. Uh, you have uh, Lovell's Island on your left in the background. That was the first runner up for the Statue of Liberty if you didn't know that fun little fact. And on the far right, George's Island. Um, this is a view of the actual site. After setting up a datum and they had a site plan, a map, they had areas that were um, marked with mats for the large machinery that was coming in. And we had a lockbox where every, all the equipment was locked up every night and uh, a place also to lock up the remains uh, and the material culture that was excavated. Um, you can see the area we actually they determined the limits of the cemetery by uh, mechanical stripping and they came down upon the grave shafts at which point um, these were assessed by the archaeologists and then they went in and they excavated. Um, you can see the wood uh, to the left is what was used to cover up these areas at night. We didn't have formal security. Um, uh, I have a lot of staff out there in the harbor. I know a lot of the pilots. They always call me and let me know what's going on, who's digging, who's using metal detectors. So it's a great way to keep eyes, uh, maintain eyeball security on the site. We were worried about that. Um, there wasn't much publicity. We wanted to get in, we wanted to get out. Um, I had been in touch with the CDC, with the virologist expert, and she was actually listed in the uh, health and safety uh, handbook that Colby Childs developed, and it, it probably weighed 50 pounds. It, it covered everything. Um, and they had a direct number to uh, Andrea in Africa. She was working in Africa at the time. I also received a cold call from the FBI, uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction, and they were concerned about bioterrorism. So uh, we had met with them and um, they offered all sorts of security, but um, it wasn't needed at the time. 
This is another view looking um, west up to the top of the Drumlin. You can see the pavilion in the back there. And again, uh, this is row one. Uh, the scope included the first three rows of remains um, to be removed. And uh, you can see the equipment and the careful, uh, they had uh, tents uh, in the event of rain and they were working extremely long hours too. And oftentimes on their bellies in very awkward positions um, to carefully uncover and um, recover uh, the human remains. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. So this is a map and it's actually showing you, it shows the shoreline in 2018 and it shows where um, those coffins were actually uh, truncated. And we uh, lost, uh, I believe a, a few remains uh, into the harbor through the years. Um, we have the burial locations marked in orange, and we also have uh, features uh, indicated by the purple um, objects. So, um, and I'm just gonna briefly mention the features. If any of you have any idea what they are, we'd love to hear from you. I don't know if they were, uh, uh, grave shafts that were inadvertently or wrongly um, excavated. They don't appear to be, they're not as deep. If they were started, not finished. Um, no material culture came out of any of them. There was no, uh, no indications, no stratigraphy, no artifacts to indicate what they might be. So I didn't know if they might be skirmish pits that were associated with the military campaigns that were out there from the 1700s on. Um, or not, but that this just gives you an indication of the, the size of the actual cemetery. So I, I'm not gonna talk too much about um, funerary hardware uh, or the coffins. There were two ba basic types, hexagonal and um, what they call the kerf sided um, cut on parallel sides at the shoulders to easily bend uh, and create that hexagonal uh, coffin. Um, the one on the left you'll see is bright, well, bright cherry red. The majority of these were painted a bright cherry red to indicate they had died from uh, smallpox. Uh, the photo on your right is a truncated uh, burial. And in fact, um, the archaeologists on site, oh, actually, before I forget, you can see the, in the photo on the left where half of it has eroded into the ocean. So only half of that was able to be recovered. On the right hand side is a um, buried, uh, 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 a, this is a cemetery on top of an earlier cemetery. They found another cemetery that predated this actual cemetery. And that was determined um, by the coffin hardware and it was determined by the shape of the uh, coffin and the location. So they were dealing with a number of anomalies out there. Um, you can imagine, um, you know, during the 1800s, um, you know, uh, burying uh, the victims, um, you know, this, this wasn't real science at that time. And this is actually a good shot of a double burial where two coffins were actually buried right on top of each other. And you can see the limited space that the archeologists had to work with. Um, they were often uh, using the boards as platforms and hanging, hovering, literally hovering over uh, the coffins while excavating in full um, Tyvek, masks, booties, uh, gloves, which were disposed of um, daily. So, um, and they were stored, uh, the, I have to tell you the, the coffins were documented, they were drawn, they were photographed, 
and they were stored on island and they were uh, disposed of as a, a biohazard. I didn't want them, uh, any form of the coffin wood getting back out into the public. It had to be disposed of properly. So we considered it a biohazard and had it um, destroyed. Um, all of the other, the remains were packed up and stored in these um, boxes. And this is the EPO actually, they came out on a stormy November day and they actually lifted all of the uh, remains onto the boat and took us back to Hingham and they offloaded them and assisted in uh, putting in the truck. So um, this came full circle again with um, uh, the dedication and commitment of people who were really not involved in um, this project and weren't paid for their services. So this is a site after, I'm sorry, it's, it's blurred. Um, it was a windy day. Um, I remember putting, I was out there with Kathy and the winds were coming in and we put the burlap down and we staked it down with plastic and we secured the, um, uh, the slough side down to the beach and had all sorts of hay. And then we sprinkled seeds and uh, grass seeds, a uh, specific type um, requested by the DEP and the notice of intent. And I remember saying, nothing's gonna stick in this 40 mile per hour wind. Well, it did. So we were quite happy with that. Um, now, I wanted to speak a little, I just wanted to show you the different types of uh, coffin fasteners that were identified in the, the burials. And for the most part, the machine cut nails um, and the wood screws date to approximately 1870, I'd say in the wire nails post 18, um, 90. Uh, there were coffin tacks. The, the, uh, these people were not embalmed. Um, they were quick burials. The coffins were made by prisoners from Deer Island that would come over. Um, there was a wood shop on island where the coffins were made and um, painted. And they were uh, made by the prisoners and the prisoners would come over on what they called the box boat, B-O-X. That's exactly what it was. The, the box boat was going around island to island, picking up people, residents, clients who were living in these, at the House of Reformation on Rainsford Island. They were living at the Deer Island prison. They were living at uh, the Rainsford Island hospital. They were, um, uh, at Long Island. Um, so the box boat was a frequent uh, vehicle out in the harbor transporting victims that were lucky enough to have family claim them. And you can imagine in the 1800s, it's not like you can pick up a telephone uh, and call someone. It was, you know, uh, a lot of wire, I guess, wire transcripts. And um, most of the people who died on the, uh, died on the island were buried on the island. Um, one of the exceptions was a wealthy librarian. Uh, his family in Wellfleet requested his body be reinterred at the family cemetery down there. So that we found that in the documents as well. So again, um, these are examples of wire nails and cut nails that were found associated with the uh, burials. And these are some of the uh, the coffin hardware, a uh, lead oil, uh, lead alloy headed tack, no fancy um, hardware at all. This was quite poignant. This was a copper patch plate that was placed over a, a knot hole that had popped out of this piece of pine um, that had been fashioned into a child's uh, coffin. And somebody had carefully taken this copper patch plate to cover the hole. You can see the outline of the hole. I'm not sure if this was the same burial where a handmade pillow was also found in the coffin um, to protect uh, the head of the, the child. In another burial, they found wood shavings almost as a preparation for um, the body uh, to lay on. And this map actually shows the distribution of buttons and personal items. Again, preservation was not good. Uh, found all sorts of 
uh, or no, I shouldn't say all sorts of limited material. Um, the left is a wool um, shirt, I believe you can see the hem and another fragment of material on the right. Buttons, 15 different types of Prosser buttons, including some that you see here. Metal buttons, wooden buttons, and you can see the intact threads on the wooden buttons. And this is an example of a bone button, which many of the clients at Long Island used to make. They used to punch them out um, uh, as requisite for their, um, I guess, payment of uh, being at the home for indigent women or uh, or men out there on Long Island. So this was one of the productions, one of the mass productions that was taking place on the islands as people were living out there. Safety pin used to um, pin possibly a shroud, a diaper, copper alloy pin. Pipe stem, this was found in the excavate. So uh, whoever was burying um, the guys, they were smokers and uh, tobacco uh, pipe smokers. And they did find in the dental analysis that most of the teeth had tobacco staining as well. Two personal uh, items, a copper alloy cross on your left and on your right, um, the back of another, excuse me, copper alloy cross with um, hair attached to it. That is part of a horsehair wig that was found during the project. Two more personal items, an iron buckle and a metal ring on your right hand side. On your left, a uh, possible brooch that was found on one of the victims and on your right, uh, glass beads from a rosary. These were all photographed, documented, repackaged and reburied with the individual, including uh, the coffin hardware as well, clothing um, and any other material culture that came out. So um, this was a forensic lab. Um, Dr. Shannon Novak is located out of Syracuse University and she's a professor there and she took on this contract. Um, although we had a, a false startup and we started up again in the fall and they adjusted their schedule. And I, I thank the entire crew for that. They were supposed to um, analyze all of the human remains at the um, state of the art forensic lab at Syracuse University, but we were not allowed to bring the remains out of state. Um, despite safety protocols, we even created a map and gave them photos of the, um, the facilities and all the equipment necessary to uh, professionally, thoroughly, accurately analyze. So during their winter break, the day after Christmas, I think, they flew in. I secured a, a, a beautiful beach house uh, in Duxbury. We steam cleaned the basement. They set up a lab down there. You can see on the right, um, the setup. And actually on the left-hand side, you can see one of the microscopes uh, that one of the uh, forensic archeologists is using to identify the remains. So, Again, they were working every day. They were able to live there, eat there. They had a great view. Um, and I, I thank them. Um, that was a, a tremendous effort to uh, take that on, especially during their vacation time. So what did they come up with? Well, this is not my area at all. And uh, you know, I'm sure Dr. Shannon Novak is gonna be publishing. And I know that Melissa and a number of our other students are gonna be um, producing PhDs out of that. So all of the skeletal and dental remains were examined using the standardized coding system that was developed by Dr. Doug Owsley uh, at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, they recorded skeletal and dental inventories, pathology, trauma, and non-metric traits. Uh, osteological analysis resulted in biological profiles of each individual and sex determined 
notes on preservation and taphonomic changes, identification and description of trauma, pathology, degenerative and activity related change, inventory of dentition, recordation of dental pathology and attrition and recordation of um, metric and non-metric traits. I was bl just blown away to find out that uh, these forensic anthropologists can determine when people were weaned by their, through their analysis. Um, so these people not only died of smallpox, but they had other specific diseases and anomalous conditions. Syphilis, tuberculosis, traumatic death, a projectile, uh, dislocation, osteoporosis, um, spinal anomalies, squatting um, anomalies. And I imagine um, um, as an archeologist doing this for the last 35 years, I'm sure if, if I went through an autopsy, squatting would be um, one of the indicators, the anomalous conditions. My doctor already told me that the insides of my shoulders are just degrading from arthritis. And he said, how come you have arthritis on the inside of your shoulders? And I was like, from picking up buckets. So the main pathologies observed in the dental remains are decay and abscesses. Tobacco staining in all of them. Um, and most of them had actually holes for where the tobacco pipes were actually held. Um, linear enamel, enamel hypoplasia uh, was represented in the tooth enamel. And this was indicative of chronic stress from infections, disease, malnutrition that disrupt growth during tooth development. And um, in summary, the preservation of the remains wasn't good, but all of them led extremely hard lives. Ethnicity and ancestry indicators. Um, these are just some indicators um, uh, suggesting descent. And um, after tabulating all of the tables and all of the reviewing all and analyzing all of the um, results, found that the majority were of African descent, followed by Asian descent, our ancestry followed by European. So again, no, did not correlate at all with our 1906 city of Boston engineering map. So who are these people? Um, I wish I could give them a name. I wish I could have put names on the, on the headstone. I wish we could have found out more about them. I'm sure there's still more work to do, but um, the forensic analysis was exhaustive. Um, we know that uh, the Albany Street Smallpox Hospital couldn't hold, uh, only held 30 paying patients. These people obviously had no means for paying. Um, and the smallpox uh, was uh, overrunning at Deer Island. And so between 1872 and 18. 73, a, a total of 1,000, over 1,000 people died. Um, 180 died on gallops and 177 were interred. So ages ranged from three months to 57 years and only six victims were below the age of 10. 105 were 20 to 29 year olds. There was one victim over 50. Um, 137 of the victims were young males. Um, 40 of these victims were females. And 12 of these victims buried on island were identified as colored in uh, the record. So here we are. Um, Dave and Tony came up a beautiful day, May 5th, almost a year ago. And on your right, you see the locked room at the city archaeology lab and Joe met us there and we packed up these beautiful artist boxes um, they're meant for um, artists to hold paints uh, originally we thought we'd get plastic baby coffins um, and that just did not seem prudent because 
the preservation was such that we didn't have many remains and we didn't have uh, much material culture. So this was a much more practical way to consolidate the remains, the material culture, and um, the data. Uh, all of the, of course, all of the bags inside the boxes were uh, in poly bags labeled, and uh, they were also labeled on the outside, all corresponding to uh, what was the, the assignment um, for the burial in the field. Um, so here we are at the city lab, and we went over to the Mount Hope, the Graceland section in Mattapan. Now this is pretty close to my house and I've been there a number of times and I was leading the parade. We had three cars packed with um, these, these people and on the way over, I realized they had just gone around and uh, uh, one particular block or this area three times and my GPS on my car was going crazy and my GPS on my phone was just going in circles. And I finally pulled over and I, I said, Dave, Tony, um, something doesn't want us to get there. Can somebody lead? So, so Dave took off and using his GPS was able to lead us to the cemetery. It was very, very strange. So we pull into the cemetery and um, I pull up front because I have the permits that were issued by the Boston Public Health Commission. And I went in to meet Tom and he came out to the car, he hopped in his car and we were all going to follow him uh, to the location for a final reburial. And um, I st I, anytime I go into a cemetery, I turn my stereo off. It's just a habit I've always had, um, no music. So I had turned the stereo off when I turned the car off and got out of the car. And when I started the car up, it, started blasting uh, Foo Fighters. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed. I'm like, we're in a cemetery. <laughs> so I, I turned it off quick, but that I was just like, that's it. You can't make this stuff up. So we drove over and carefully unpacked um, these people. Uh, and they were carefully placed by cemetery staff. Every box was photographed going in and put on yet another database. And then it was carefully uh, covered up. And actually you see on the left-hand side, the machine that's covering it up. And um, it was actually not a new part of the cemetery, but a, a newly uh, re, um, fur not furnished, but what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they had taken an old roadway and turned it into more, uh, another burial parcel because they're just running out of land. This uh, cemetery has been around for a very, very long time. So, um, and that is the back of the stone that is there uh, right now. We, um, Dave and I talked about putting a, a, a QR code on the stone and we still can. Um, I talked to the stone carver and Dave, uh, George developed a, um, uh, a story and uh, we wanna share the data that the historians generated and the information that the forensic anthropologist uh, found and uh, the story of these people because there are many, many stories besides the history of smallpox in Boston, Boston the history of medicine the history of quarantine, the history of the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, there are so many different stories um, that can be told and the stories of these, these people um, that probably knew when they went out to gallops that they weren't going to um, return. And um, it's, it's poignant today how uh, you know connected to the past we, we really are. So, um, with that, looking forward, I'd, I'm happy to um, say that um, Dr. Novak and um, Melissa are um, currently working, uh, the, the World Health Organization has, is supporting uh, additional isotopic research at McGallister University in Ontario, 
um, looking to extract DNA to answer the following questions. How did variola as a virus originate? What strains of variola virus were circulating in the late 18th and early 19th century as vaccination became a more common preventive measure? And last, what non-destructive sampling techniques can yield effective extraction of endogenous DNA, thereby advancing genomic understanding or historical pathogens while presenting medical collections in perpetuity? So with that, you know, I I I I have to thank I have to thank Dave and Kathy and Chris Goodwin and all the people that actively engaged and dedicated themselves um, to this complicated project. Um, it was a, a joy to work with you, a joy to meet you, and I'm uh, very pleased with the success. And I hope that our our um, victims are, are resting peacefully again. So thank you. What time is it, Lindsay? You're fine. Uh, it's 2.20, we're okay. Um, okay. If anyone needs to go, we totally understand. Um, but thank you, Ellen, uh, that was wonderful. And we already have some questions coming in. So again, anyone else, if you have some questions, you can put it in the chat for me. Um, so our first two questions are very similar. So I'm gonna read them both. And I think your answer will sort of hit on what the two people want. So one is smallpox vaccination is no longer required or even available except for the military. So does this sort of thing mean that it should be given to archeology span students? Um, <laughs> and the other one is, can Ellen say more about the potential viral risks of excavating remains of smallpox victims? Is there really so much risk so long after the case? Right, no, excellent questions and that was one of the major issues um, that had to be uh, researched and discussed. I had been talking with uh, Andrea, I think McCollum is a head virologist at the CDC. I've been in touch with the CDC. Um, you can actually get vaccinated for with the smallpox, excuse me, vaccination in Atlanta. They only offer it, I think in Russia and Atlanta, there are a couple of venues around the world that offer it and people do get it. Um, the CDC is looking for live DNA, um, smallpox DNA. Um, so yes, the, the option was there and could have been considered. Um, and we took all precautions in uh, working with, um, uh, they were not in full SCBAs. I, I've worked on projects where we've been in full containment units because of contamination where we probably shouldn't have been involved, but all urban areas are contaminated. I mean, well, they were using- that's actually, the third question is, can you speak more about the precautions taken? Oh, well, um, I, I've worked on sites where, you know, they've taken samples and the samples have dissolved the container, for instance. Um, they, you know, back in the 17 and 1800s, they were using arsenic and mercury to cleanse things. Um, this is a particularly fascinating area for the development of, you know, vaccines and, and medicine and the treatment of um, contagions um, through time. And Boston Harbor Island sort of is a prison, prism from that. Um, I know on Rainsford Island, they were actually using smoke and brimstone. They were actually putting people and cargo in, these tents that where they were lighting sulfur to fumigate, thinking that these were miasmas, these were airborne. But um, they used full precautions. I know um, our boat operators were like, we don't want to transport anybody or anything that's been near, you know, a smallpox victim. So we uh, we even Hull, Massachusetts wouldn't allow us to come in with the remains. And that was my fault as well, because I had mentioned something about the project to someone um, and found out it's best not to talk about things. Just go and do it. Do your research, go out there, do it and um, move on. But um, no, total precautions for any time excavating in an urban area um, or otherwise. Um, you just never know what you're going to find. 
Um, you know, most of the time you're working in an urban area and you get a smell, um, uh, sort of an oily or, you know, uh, contaminant smell. And you know that it probably was a gas station or there may have been some type of a uh, contaminated lot. But for the most part, most of your urban areas are um, contaminated. So um, precautions, uh, they were considered, um, they were optional to get a smallpox inoculation and they didn't. Um, so uh, our, my biggest fear was losing Kathy's crew on the dock because the dock was, should not have been used. They were missing um, slats. In some places they had to jump three feet from one portion of the dock to the other. And I was worried about losing people. So um, it, uh, it was thoroughly researched. We talked to the experts. We had uh, Andrea, the virologist on speed dial. We had Colby Child with his 2000 page health and safety um, notebook. And um, uh, they were very cautious. I hope I answered that. Uh, I think you did. Uh, so is there going to be any additional work on the island going forward since you said this was only part of the... Yeah, the I need to find 2.5 million more to get the remaining um, victims out of there. We really don't know how many are out there, um, potentially for up to 250 more. Um, the island is good for another 50 years regarding um, sea level rise or any other natural factors that may impact the shoreline. Um, the next steps for the island, if DCR uh, gets $6 million, they're gonna be doing asbestos rebatement. The island is closed to the public now because of the contaminants that are out there. Um, you know, I mentioned smallpox. Um, I didn't even get into the history of quarantine or vaccinations, but um, we had a guinea pig lab out on gallops. We had a black plague lab out on gallops. We had a horse serum um, factory out on gallops. And these are all focused around, um, you know, generating new protection for any or all of these contagions that were out there. We had soldiers in 2008, uh, 2000, in 1918 that were being inoculated with the flu, the Spanish influenza. So a lot of experimentation was going on, not just on Gallops, but um, I know on Rainsford, um, I know on even Long Island, um, shoot, after World War II, Von Braun and his brother were out there sharing recipes with you know nuclear physicists from MIT. So they were doing all sorts of crazy stuff out there um, and getting away with it. So. Um, yeah, I'm sure people don't like to hear that the Harbor Islands are contaminated, but be careful where you dig. Um, okay, our last two questions. Uh, did the forensic archaeologists find any potential relationships between the smallpox victims? Oh, you know what? I am sorry. I can't off the top of my head answer that, but there was a woman that was buried with two children, two, ba two children on either side. And I'm, I forget, and I apologize. I forget what, if there was a corresponding, if there was any type of correspondence between that. Good question. How about I, I reread the, you know, 5,000 page report or I go find the information and I'll share it with Lindsay. Perfect. Sorry. Um, the last question, um, did these people become sick on the mainland and then taken to Gallops to die? Or were they coming to Boston on ships and not allowed to go to the mainland and had to stay on the island because they were- Oh, excellent question. All of the above. Um, one of the uh, boats coming in, um, they were contacted and told there's a guy on board with smallpox. They got stopped the boat, got him off. He escaped. Um, and he, we heard later that he recovered, he swam away. <laughs> um, but they were coming from the mainland um, and they were being pulled off of boats. Um, not just smallpox victims, but yellow fever victims. Um, a leper actually was brought to 
uh, Gallops Island before being deported down to Buzzards Bay to the leopard colony down there. All of this information, all of this history was um, brought to life by the historians um, at Goodwin and Associates and um, Heritage Consulting LLC. So the, um, the data is uh, extensive and um, I hope that we can find funding to get the GR code, the QR code up and to continue telling the story. I'm sure there are gonna be many, many publications that come out of it. Um, uh, it's certainly reflective of a, a time before economic prosperity, before medical technology, before you know what we know today about contagions and um, demographics and uh, immigration. Um, and it's just uh, sad to know that so many people were lost. Um, I, and just as today, uh, trying to get a hold on a, a virus of this nature is um, uh, pretty, pretty. Um, it's difficult. It's not easy. At all. I, I don't know how, I don't know how the doctors and nurses uh, and scientists are, are dealing with it. It must just be like trying to catch up. They must be working 24 hours a day, just trying to stay ahead of it, trying to stay afloat. I still can't believe they got vaccines out within a year. That's just amazing. Pretty amazing. But hey, well, thank you for the opportunity, Lindsay. Well, hey, and if Carol Weed's out there, thank you for the donation, Carol. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, Ellen, and thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next lecture. Um, which is on Wednesday, May 5th, and we will be joined by Dr. Kira Singleton, who will be speaking about the um, Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum, which is in Medford, Massachusetts. And again, we rely on support of viewers like you, so consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So thank you, everyone. Have a great Wednesday. You too, Lizzie.